Hey there, happy Friday, everybody. I am Sadia Davis, the director for the Center for Creative Entrepreneurship. And we are so excited to have a special guest in house with us today. But before we get started, for those of you who are just turning in or learning about the Center for Creative Entrepreneurship, we are generously funded by the Coleman Foundation. And thank goodness to Arts Alliance Illinois for being our fiscal sponsor. We are the nonprofit arm of 2112, the largest creative co-working space and creative incubator of entrepreneurial businesses in the world. We're really excited to be able to provide resources to all of what your business needs for its sustainable success. So when you have an opportunity and you're curious, check us out online on our website. Be sure to log on to our YouTube page to find out more other exciting talks that we've had in the past. In fact, next week, we're excited to have um, a talk on creative co-working spaces, so we're talking about creating community building for the creative entrepreneur. And we will have a creative co-working space for POC. I've never heard of that. Just heard of it today. People of color and everybody else. And then we also will be joined by a company that has a vegan test kitchen. And so we look forward to sharing their new venture with you next week. So let's get started with today. Super excited to have Tony Vitale. He is a serial entrepreneur, a filmmaker, so much more. Tony is an American film director, screenwriter, producer, and television producer. He is best known for the 1997 film, Kiss Me Guido, released by Paramount Pictures. And from what I understand, it went through Sundance Films at that time, or Sundance at the time. <laughs> So, so many great things as far as, you know, he's a pioneer of the use of an IPTV technology and broadcast TV programming to help create a dedicated OTT streaming channels. He'll have to explain some of what this means to us. With over 30 years in media and entertainment, he developed and produced film, video, television, and commercial productions, created project-based business plans, detailed and up to 10 million plus budgets for productions. Founder and executive producer of Bronx Born Films, he's worked with, get ready, Martin Landau, Louis Fletcher, Matthew Modine, Ben Garza, Charles Dunning, and Burt Young, Christopher Malkin, <laughs> Red House, Robert Wagner, Chaz Palmineri, wow, and Robert Davy, and award-winning, Andy Garcia, Mick Jagger, so many to name, James Coburn, Angela Houston, and with Oscar winning Ang Lee. Vitaly graduated from Iona College with a degree in finance and minor in communications. He studied film at NYU and now he, you know, you can find him and you can take classes with him making <laughs> filmmaking at Columbia College. Right. Boy, you know, how do you, how do you like wrap it all up and you can't, you can't. I say, who is that guy? I don't even know him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wow, there's just so much and I'm so excited and my tongue is getting twisted. Welcome. Thank Tony, you. how are you? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I'm, uh, this is fun. Boy, when you, when you read all that off, I mean, 30 years just kind of flashed by me. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's, it's been a road. It's been a road. <laughs> you know, it's so fun. You, you shared a story with me um, about your daughter, right? Mm -hmm. You've done so much in your world. And yet, you know, when we create these legacies of companies and careers, then we have people who are around us, right? Mm -hmm. And who don't know all of that. So tell us a little bit about you, your family, and uh, we'll get into it. Oof. All right. Well, I'm going to allow you to cut me off when you want to cut me off. Um, I am a born and raised in the Bronx. And I took a lot of pride in that um, because Brooklyn was always on the map and I felt like, you know, who cares about us up in the Bronx? Um, and then something happened. I went to go see a one man show called A Bronx Tale uh, that was playing on the lower, uh, actually it was on the Upper East Side, small theater. And when I saw Chaz Palminteri perform that show, I was, I was blown away. It's like he was putting the Bronx on the map in my eyes. Um, and the fact that he was just telling a simple story made me feel like, yeah, I want to do that. 
I was working down Wall Street at the time, um, working at the New York Stock Exchange. Um, I was taking film classes at NYU um, as more like a hobby, but never really thought of it as a career. And then I saw that play and I went up to uh, Chaz right after that play. And I said to him, I said, if you ever make this into a movie, I want to be a part of it. I don't know how, I just want to be a part of it. And that was really the first step in my film career. Um, I hassled Tribeca Films who purchased the rights to that. I let them know the same thing that I wanted to work on the movie. Um, I got hired as a location scout on that movie, scouted locations. Um, first for a film called Night in the City, which I think is the funny story that you're referencing. <laughs> um, but that's, the, that's the whole paint drying story. Yeah. Um, but then that started my career. And I started taking writing classes, wrote a couple of screenplays, made Kiss Me Guido, did get into Sundance, sold it to Paramount, moved to Hollywood. Um, yeah. And you know, there, there's a lot to unpack there. And we've got an hour. So oh, wow. I'm okay. have time to do it. Well, then, um, yeah, yeah, I'll just say this. One disclaimer. What? You think that there's only two of us out here. I have a little dog underneath. So there's actually three of us. And he may interrupt us at any time, so I don't know. I've got one under my feet too, so now okay. four of us. Okay. <laughs> and if somebody comes close to that door, you're gonna hear a bark. But we generally have been okay through most of our streams. Cool. So I wanna touch base on something that's so sweet. Mm -hmm. Even before you had an opportunity to go to Chaz Palminteri and say you wanna work on something with him, you saw him in something. Let's mm -hmm. talk about that, that is so sweet when that happens, when you see something that's inspiring, that inspires you, and then you get to not only communicate with someone within the production, but then you've worked with them later. So talk a little bit about what that piece was like. Oh, wow, that's a great question. Um, inspiration is critical if you're an artist. If you are only wanting to be an artist for your ego to satisfy um, yourself because you want to be known, you're making a huge mistake. There's not enough there to keep you at it, to keep you dedicated to wanting to hone in on, on what you're good at, your talent, your craft. Um, so please never underestimate the power of passion or love for something or true inspiration because it takes that to move you from point A to point Z, but even to point B, C, D, E, and F, which are going to be so many obstacles along the way. Um, I was blown away. I was blown away by a Bronx tale because it resonated to make me feel like, you know, people could know me and whatever I could do to help that story get out there is what I wanted to do. I went and saw that play two more times after the initial scene. <laughs> and on the third time, I, I brought in back in the day, there was uh, like a little hand recorder that you, you hold in your hand and you talk into. And I brought a little hand recorder to record every word that was in that play. And then I went out and I made a short little film about what my vision would be visually of what a Bronx Hill is. Wow. So that, yeah, I sent that to uh, Tribeca Films, hassled, De Niro's receptionist for two straight years, almost every month was like two straight years. And then finally she said, well, you know, I could introduce you to a location manager on a film called Night in the City where you could be an intern, maybe. And I said, I'm in, let me know. Where do I, who do I gotta see, where do I gotta go? That's right, I mean, that determination, right? So you spoke about passion, you spoke about like having that truth of wanting to do it, not just based on vanity or ego, that's not gonna carry you through, but determination gets you in through the door because people feel like, well, if you're that committed, I mean, you can't really mess up anything if we, if we put you on production, PA. You know, th so that's really sweet because that journey and explaining it helps others to understand how to break through certain areas of industries, right? That they are curious about. Yeah, I, I have to. I now, now, because I remember the story that I told you now, and I, yeah. I would be remiss if I didn't keep that story going. So, when I got, um, when I went in for my interview as an intern, now I'm 25 years old at the time, and I'm leaving a, a job down Wall Street that was paying me really well. And, but I wanted to be an intern on a film 
uh, and I really wanted to work on the Bronx Tale. So on my interview with the location manager, and as I'm sitting in the office, she said, well, I really don't have a position for you, but her phone rings. And as the phone rings, the person that was supposed to go up to Harlem um, couldn't make it, and she needed a warm body just to go up to Harlem to open up a door and watch paint, literally watch paint. Um, she asked me if I would do it. I said, sure. She gave me a, a token, which we used at the, on the subway at the time. I went up to Harlem, and my job, my first day in the film business was to sit on a paint can and watch paint dry in this four room, large room up on 138th Street and 2nd Avenue in Harlem. And I sat on that paint can. It's like, what the hell did I just do with my life? <laughs> paint dry. But here's the great part of the story. The next day, they sent me back up there and they said, um, would you mind showing Bob, Robert De Niro, around the room? He wants to get a feel of it before he performs in the scene. I'm like, ah, yeah, I don't mind. I can do that. So the first day watching paint dry, the second day escorting Robert De Niro around a, a location up in Harlem. And that's, that's my life. <laughs> that, that is the sweetest antidote, right? Because like when people are like thinking, you know, oh, you know, I'm doing this job and I'm getting paid pennies. Right. But sometimes we can't see what's on the other side and the blessing or or right. the payoff, if you will. Watching paint dry. I'm literally sitting here going, you watch paint right. dry. But let's <laughs> touch base on this because here's the thing. You were working on the New York Stock Exchange, mm -hmm. including Black Monday, the stock market crash of 1987, okay, when you were studying at NYU. So to go from that like high powered environment to sitting and watching paint dry and you were still ready. So was it like Nero comes in and you're like, we call it, for those of you who don't know, getting bit by the bug. And that's when you're on stage and you get that rush and that feeling and you're like, I gotta live with this. If it's you're in a production and you're you're an actor or you're a producer and you're watching magic happen and you're like, I gotta live with this. It's that getting bit by the bug. Would you say that that part bit you when you were walking through and showing him or was it just the entire experience altogether? No, well, you know, bit by the bug. Um, man, I, I was bitten quite a bit <laughs> okay. you know, through high school. Ow. Ow. Yeah. Even through college, but could not commit. I could not commit to the arts to the point where, uh, when I was a senior in college, I had an internship down wall street. Um, and because I had taken so many credits, I could have graduated early, but they allowed me to take a communications class. And that communications class was another word of saying like a film history class. But when I took that film history class, that was another huge bite, but I didn't know what to do with it. And so I did like what everyone else does when they have to you know, choose between going into the arts or you know, working down Wall Street. I took off for Club Med and DJed around the world for two years. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's a silly story, but you know, how does that all relate? Oh, it relates. I came back. I came back from uh, Club Med. I met someone that worked down Wall Street and said, look him up if, uh, you know, if I ever came back and wanted to work with him. I did. I started working as a runner down Wall Street. I was down there for the crash. Mm -hmm. and I thought, wow, this is a really important moment in time. And I'm seeing it from the inside out because I was working on the floor. Yeah. And I remember that night I went home and I just wrote a little story. Here's the great thing about that. Wanting to make that story, that movie, either a documentary or a film, stuck so dear in my heart. Mm -hmm. 25 years later, I finally had the opportunity to make that documentary. Mm -hmm. So the thing about being an artist, once again, if you've got something so embedded in your heart so important that you have to get it out there before you die. Yeah. You've got something there. Yeah. And I never gave up on that story. I never knew how it was going to happen. I knew it was going to happen one day. Um, and I was blessed to, you know, to be able to make that story right here in Chicago. 
Beautiful. You know, it's such a blessing to have you here. You know, part of what we are tasked with, or at least I take it seriously, is retaining talent. Mm. Here in Chicago, specifically Illinois, um, so many creatives come from Chicago. Um, when we think of Chandra Rhimes, I mean, yeah, she has some of the hottest shows on network TV on ABC mm -hmm. from Chicago, whether it's musicians, right? Um, a lot of people leave for the coast, um, but Illinois is really determined, especially with having Senate space here, shout out to Alex Vizios and those 60 plus acres. Uh, with over 33 sounds, well, it's about 33 sound stages, and to the hangar stage, which is over at 2112. We are determined to create create talent, to film projects, music projects, all the good things, but um, really to retain and keep people here. So it's so great to have you here, and uh, you know, surviving the floor alone, <laughs> you know, and not losing your mind is one thing, but to maintain your passion and take it into a space of creativity is brilliant. Um, talk to us a little bit about that transition of going, cause you know, you, you've done a lot of film and TV and let's talk a little bit about your pioneering aspect of this streaming world, right? Because before we get to, you know, vertical grooves, I, I really love that you have had a hand in successful streaming shows and that finance background translates into tasty trade. I think it's so important for people to see that there's always a through line, you know, and people say, oh, you do so many things, but there's a thread in all of what you do. Um, so let's talk about that. Um, another really good question. So my, uh, my third movie that I did with uh, Christopher Walken, um, got caught up, and it was a movie about a DJ. <laughs> so talk about threads, you know, there's another thread right there. Um, it got caught up in a legal battle, and I had essentially a $6 million film with Christopher Walken and Rucka Hauer that I could not get out into the marketplace. And this was around, I'd say 2000, I shot the movie in 2000, so we're now talking about 2001, 2002 was semi-complete. Um, and the idea of digital streaming just started becoming a thought. Like, boy, if I was able to retain the rights back to my film, mm -hmm. I could potentially self-distribute or connect with a digital streamer and I can bypass the studio system. So that put me on the path of learning as much as I could about digital streaming. Of course, we all heard of that other little company called Netflix. Um, and this was all happening around the same time. Well, the idea of doing it for television was something that also came up. I went to a party and someone was talking about how they wanted to do that you know, for the world of television. Uh, right before Oprah uh, did the own network, they had an idea about doing something like that. So a little bit more research, a little bit more research, a little bit more research. And I wrote up a white paper about how you can potentially set up a digital streaming network for, you know, if you had an idea um, how you could use this new technology, this new IPTV technology to get your word out, get your message out, get your story out. And you could potentially do it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year all online, so you, you could bypass the typical distribution system. Um, the second person that I met when I talked about it um, was a gentleman named Tom Sosnoff here in Chicago. And um, I came here because I, I thought I was gonna do a reality show for Fox. Mm -hmm. But when I spoke with Tom and he said, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't wanna do a reality show. I wanna, I wanna build my own network. And I said, I think I can help you with that. Yeah. <laughs> a week later, I was in Chicago, and then we built Tasty Trade. That's fantastic. You know, it's um, one of the things that has become very clear through this pandemic is that all of us have had to figure out how to produce for this thing, right? For this screen. For us, 
just stepping into creating the Center for Creative Entrepreneurship. We only launched in February. We didn't have enough time to kick out our, you know, press release. So nobody even knew that we existed. However, we were getting funding from the Coleman Foundation. And I'm like, ah, I don't want them to redirect funds because all the institutions were redirecting funds. I wanted them to see the value of what we had to give to our creative entrepreneurs and at a time where they really needed it. So we created this talk where we started on Thursdays and then we had them on Fridays. And we were like, well, you know, all of the busiest people are all sitting down right now. So we reached out to some directors and writers and producers who normally would be working and unaccessible. And we got them engaged in these conversations, which have now provided us a bit of a platform to still keep people motivated. But we all had to switch from going from having a panel discussion in person on a main stage, mm -hmm. to presenting that panel discussion in a format like this. Um, so you know, you guys were leaders in that. And I would venture to say that one of the other things that's come out of it is that we've all sort of broken the chains of cable, if you will. So I just broke from cable <laughs> and I got a Roku you know? for you. and I've got Sling. Welcome, welcome to the party. We will be so long. I know, I know, I know. It was like I was attached to this $250 bill. I'm like, this is crazy. This is madness. So I say that because in the film industry, music industry, there are three major companies in film and music, right? So let's say music, it's Sony, BMG, Universal. It's very similar to film, right? Disney, Sony, Universal. <laughs> Am I missing one? Oh, Par Paramount. People Paramount. Do, uh... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so what's happening is artists are now able to create and provide content. And all of these other networks are now providing streaming networks, right? So we've got Plus over here. We've got Prime over here. We, you know, So this whole world is sort of shifting before our very eyes. Mm -hmm. And one could say tasty trade in terms of finance. And if you guys need to learn anything about where the markets are and everything, I checked it out. Um, it's fun. It's engaging. It's moving. And as you know, I got excited. I was like, you know, right now people really need to know what to do with their money. <laughs> if, if it, if it were a time, right? Right. right. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's very cool. Now switching gears a little bit, or mm -hmm. should I say roll the tape back? Richard, can we get like being your DJ switching onto the DJ thread? So going from this this point of loving music, playing music, to now owning a an instrument, right. <laughs> if you, you will. With that. No, that's perfect. I love it. That's, that's it, you know, I call it right. An instrument that then plays the record vertically. Talk to us a little bit about vertical grooves. So um, while I was at Tasty Trade, um, we had a show, we still do, uh, they do, but a show called Bootstrapping in America. And all these you know, really fantastic entrepreneurs come on and present their products or their service. Um, and someone came on with a vertical turntable, which I absolutely fell in love with. Um, cut to, you know, years later, um, last year or so, I was talking to someone about this and they absolutely loved the turntable too. And it would be, whatever happened to that turntable? So that exploration, uh, took me on a path to find out what had happened with it. And when I heard there was a certain amount of stagnation to the company and they weren't making the turntable anymore. I said, that's so stupid. This thing is beautiful. Um, I love vinyl. There's a lot of vinyl lovers out there. Um, and I said, let, let me explore to see what I could do to start getting this product out there again. So um, that's what I've done. I've done that with a partner. And um, we're hoping to release beta test, at least uh, the new release, the new modified version for Christmas. Ooh, for Christmas? It's a, it's a really big wish. <laughs> it's not super far fetched. Let's wish. Let's but, wish. Uh, yeah, but you know, crazy things have happened in my life. Well, I will say that 
I was a member at 1871 mm-hmm. when at the time the vertical turntable turntable was being created. Mm-hmm. And it is fascinating. And I'm so glad you searched for it. So let's share with everyone what we're talking about. Cool. Yeah. Somehow autumn brought me here again Temperatures and thoughts crash into skin I'll put your record on I'll put your record on Let's turn love into something we can sing I mean, let, let, let's like, let's pre-sale them. Like, like, you know, I mean, however I can help, whatever I can do, you know, ver- you know, vinyl, it, it, there's something about it and everybody's loving vinyl again. Right. So I know that they're even selling record players and records over at like clothing stores. Right. right? So there, it's a thing, whether we get it in, you know, what, whatever we can do to help amplify it. Um, I'll put your record on. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. I, you got it. <laughs> yeah. This this is something that not only is it a turntable, it's like a work of art. It's beautiful. Even the way that the speakers are. And so many people are spending more time at home because mm-hmm. we have to in order to shelter in place and be safe with all that's going on out there. Um, so I feel like, you know, people can get together and have a mini listening party, obviously socially distancing, um, come up with ways to engage around um, music of the past and music currently that's produced on vinyl. It, it will blow you away. I could send you dozens of videos of what people are doing with vinyl yeah. as art, the, the, the 12 inch disc, as art, you know, with faces and holograms. And I mean, there's just a plethora of creative ideas just based on that. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel this not only offers something up acoustically, yeah. it almost serves as like an easel to that art, which yeah. makes it really badass. And you know, that's the third version. We're gonna come out with a version called the Superfly Badass version. Nice. Which, uh, <laughs> Which, uh, you know, three different three different pricing strategies, which is you know very business minded. But I said, okay, I want to name the highest pricing strategy the Superfly Badass model. So that's you know, yeah. you're reminding me of our friend and our CCE advisor Martin Atkins, uh-huh. and he's all about you know compounding and creating. There's a term he uses by which I had my notes nearby, but basically it's this idea, right, of having multiple price points and levels and amplifying that way. And then he comes up with like really cool titles, like what you just said. <laughs> That's great. Um, one was, you know, get out of the bed coffee <laughs> for, um, for dark matter coffee around this pandemic. And, he, you know, he told this really incredible story about how, you know, he went to his favorite coffee shop to get 
coffee. And the guy was like, listen, man, we're really suffering. You know, they were having some financial difficulties around the pandemic. Everybody's going through it. So he's like, I donated a hundred dollars. And he's like, I got home and I realized, wait a minute, he has a hundred employees. So that's only like, a, that's like a dollar. That's not a lot. So he came up with this idea of screen, creating a screen bag that said, get out of the bed coffee <laughs> and he created one for eight dollars which would go straight to the company twenty eight dollars seventy five dollars and a hundred and eight dollars then he pulled back and he did you know kind of looked at researched it and saw that the same amount of percentage the highest percentage bought the twenty eight dollar and the hundred and eight dollar and he just it compounded and then you know all of a sudden the coffee cafe was making more money. And then he came out with take a shower coffee <laughs> and they put, they made like bar soap out of coffee beans and put it in there. Right. And then the next one was take a shower <laughs> coffee and, and, and then it just blew up. Right. It didn't take a lot. It took an idea and it took executing that idea. And now other companies are doing similar things in order to, you know, call it grass market. What is it? Grassroot marketing. marketing. Yeah. yeah. Guerrilla marketing. Yeah. Guerrilla marketing. Yeah. So these things aren't complicated. Um, so I'm really excited about finding ways to, like I said, however we can be an amplifier for vertical grooves. Um, I mean, even, you know, creating a dance party where we maybe have multiple ones, DJs battling off. I mean, well, wouldn't that be fun? That was, that was one of the first, again. So now I go back to my old, school DJing days. Yeah. And when you watch DJs now, because I, I watch all these DJs, you know, online and their head is stuck down like this, you know, so, you know, they're going like this and their head is stuck down. They're all vinyl aficionados, but to see the music, to see that vinyl spin, and then you add another element to it where that vinyl is also a piece of art as well. I just felt like there was something here. It's like almost you could take your, your top DJs from around the world and I'll give them one to kind of play their favorite pressed vinyl. Well, let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Meaning like some other people may say, hey, I really like that kind of turntable for myself. I, you know, I'd like to buy one. Uh, oh, here's something else you could do with that turntable. I want to get one and modify it. And boom, you just grow and grow and grow. But you said something about um, pricing structure, which is a very um, – it's a very business-minded way of looking at it, a three-tier pricing structure. Um, you talked about this gentleman walking right into the coffee shop, and all of a sudden the spark started happening. Um, and I don't know who he is, but I'm sure he's also a very disciplined guy. And the reason why I'm um, – want to talk about that is you need all three if you're going to be a success in the arts especially you need a combination of all three in order to not only create something but create something good okay i mean uh, in the world of video today anyone can pick up their phone and create a video how do you create a good video that takes a little bit of craft it takes a little bit of time takes a little bit of discipline when you see an edit and there's one little edit wrong and you try to fix it and it takes you five hours to fix that one little edit. Um, I mentioned that because, you know, as people are trying to figure out how to be a business person, how to be an artist and what does it really take in order to get, you know, capture that success, mm -hmm. that third element luck has got to be there. and You just never know when luck is going to happen. You just, and you don't. You can't control it. You have to let the wind take you where it's going to take you. I, you know, this idea that I had for the the you know wanting to do a stock market crash movie about that. I had no idea that that was going to ever happen in my life, but I never lost that. And then I was fortunate enough to meet a, a you know a man who has a lot of brilliant creative ideas. He's not shy about throwing certain things out there and supporting it. Um, I'm talking about Tom over at Tasty Trade, um, and it happened. But 
you know, that was 20 plus, 25 plus years after the initial flood. So something, you know, special inside you, keep at it. You never know when it's going to happen. It's yeah. going to be a combination of discipline, talent, and luck. Yeah, I, w I would absolutely agree. And I would throw passion in there because that was the first thing you started with. And it is a key integral ingredient. Um, DJ, it's his name is D nice, right? Mm -hmm. Through the pandemic, one girlfriend sent me a note. Oh, you got to check this out. We were on Instagram live and it was like all these people were clicking in. It was like 10,000 people, 25,000. Let's get to 50,000. Then it was like, 150,000. Oh my God, let's get to, and it was like blowing us away. And it was like, somebody call, everybody was like, text Oprah, text Tyler Perry, text. It was like Shaka Khan was in there. And so he would play Shaka Khan's records. And then it was like, oh my God, Oprah's in here. Oh, the first lady, Michelle Obama's in here. And then he was like, oh, to my first lady, Michelle Obama. And he was playing her music because he had right. DJed their parties before. And this thing blew up, right? And he was the first one for some reason to just play his music. Oh, he would switch his hats. Yep. He would drink and everybody was like, tip the man. And so we were like sending drinks and he'd be like, be right back. And like <laughs> people were sending bottle service to him, right? His whole thing blew up. We watched it happen. We were all in there as a part of it. That one, oh, and that was the other thing. IG shut him down because it was like, it was going over an hour. We're like, Mark oh. is in here. He's in here. Don't shut him down. <laughs> and then it didn't shut down. Like it, it let it, they let it go. So it was like, damn, that was really powerful. There were so many powerful people. Norman Lear jumped in. We're like, is that really Norman Lear? It was really Norman Lear. It was like, <laughs> were you in there? Do you know what I'm talking about? I, I, I read about it, but I wasn't, I wasn't in there. But I, after reading that story, it's stories like that that kept me on this path. Yeah. Right. You know, when I said, you know, you need A to B to C. Yes. Well, when you're wondering, am I doing the right thing? Do I spend all the time doing this? Is anyone going to like it? You know, are people really like desirable to like yeah. get into this groove, vertical grooves? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you don't know. And then you read something like that and say, yes, that's it. Right. I am on the right path. People do want to connect. How are they going to connect? They got, you know, it, yeah. it, it feeds on each other and the validation that you get when you see things like that, evolve things like that, you know, be part of that evolution. Um, it's great. It's yeah. Great. You know, I want to remind the viewers who are watching, they're ticking up, ticking back and forth. You know, we're never, we're never focused on how many people are watching Tony, because a lot of people watch after the fact, but I always yeah. like to encourage people to ask us any questions. Um, we'd love to be able to place your questions or comments as we're having this conversation. I wanted to touch um, really quickly on one thing that you said. Um, you know, earlier you mentioned being from the Bronx, you mentioned living in LA, and you've mentioned now living in Chicago. Have you lived anywhere else? And of those three places, what would you say or where would you say you've had the most, um, let's just say comfort? Oh, man, that's too tough of a question. I know. Um, well. Because I've lived in all three places too. Yeah, I, well, yeah, so I, I do have my patented line about, uh, about that. Um, you know, uh, and again, I'm going to, I'm going to butcher this quote. I think it was part of a song, but I use it all the time. They say, yeah. you know, everyone's got to live in New York once in their life, but get out before you get too hard. And then everyone else has got to live in LA once in their life, but get out before you get too soft. Oh. So <laughs> when I landed here in Chicago, I was like, all right, I am perfectly balanced. I got my Zen place here. That was Chicago right in the middle of the country. Um, you know, I, lived in the Turks and Caicos Islands. Um, Where you shot the movie that's behind you? Yes, that's uh, it's called Life's a Beach. And that's Christopher Walken lying down there on, on the beach in Turks. Aww. Um, but I've lived, uh, you know, so that afforded, working for, for Club Med afforded me to live in a bunch of different places around the world. What, I'm sorry, uh, you said you worked for Club Med? I did, I was a DJ for Club Med. That's, that's how... <laughs> I got roll, to roll that tape back just a moment. You got to explain that because okay, so we're we're counting careers, right? We got to we got to circle back and say which career you're on. But Club Med, talk about that a little when bit. I, when I was in college, I um, I worked in the library during the week, during the day, and I DJed on the weekends. Um, 
And then as I was interning downtown, down Wall Street, I really hated the internship. I said, is this really what life is all about? And my friend's sister worked at the Club Med offices down there. And she said, oh, you should stop in. And if you ever want to be a DJ for Club Med, you know, you should kind of inquire. So on the way home after a really bad long day of being an intern down Wall Street, I stopped in as a fluke. Uh, I let them know what I do. I said, but you know, I'm a senior in college. I, you know, I, you know, don't get so aggressive with me. I don't even know if I really want to do this. Well, they called me up twice and I had to reject them twice because I was still in school. And then literally on the day of graduation, I came home and still not knowing what I was going to do with my life. I said, we're going to give you one more chance. Do you want to be a DJ in a Luthra? And I said, uh, and I was hanging out with my friend and I said, um, uh, yeah, okay. And I had no idea what the, where a Luthra was. I just said yes. And uh, they <laughs> FedEx tickets to me the next day. <laughs> I told my family, my friends, I was leaving. And I was on a plane to a Luthra, which is a small island in the Bahamas. Woo, nice. I wound up, wound up doing that for about two years, almost two years. Wow, what a way to like sail into the sunset like after college. I know. That's pretty well, good. Here. And so now here, so I dj I DJ down there, which was, you know, fantastic. Yeah. I was um, sitting around at a dinner table with, now again, this is 1985. Okay. So the, um, the gay, straight communities weren't interlocked as they, um, the sentiment was a lot different today than it was in 1985. Let's just put it yeah. that way. Yes, right. And so my boss... And the French culture is a far more open culture, especially at that time, than the American culture. My boss, who was openly gay, which was not very obvious in the Bronx. I didn't know anyone who was openly gay in the Bronx. Right, right, right. Um, but my boss was, and we became friends. And well, you know, sometimes the, we would go out to dinner, and there was another young lady that, that came out to dinner with us. And we would laugh and we would entertain some of the guests by our different attitudes because I'm hardcore Guido now. <laughs> um, right. And one night she bought, she said, you know what? Would it be great if you two guys did like your own television sitcom? And, you know, I could be the landlady and yada, yada, yada. And be like, yeah, that could be pretty funny. That night I went home and I wrote the first couple of lines of what I thought could be a sitcom. Um, I came back home. <laughs> I wrote the movie "Kiss Me, Guido." Got into the Sundance Film Festival. Paramount bought it. Walked into the PBS television uh, office. I said, "I really think you should make this into a television show." They looked at it. They said yes. And then I made a TV show with Jason Bateman and um, Danny Nucci called "Some of My Best Friends" with Mark Cherry. So, okay, I didn't see that in your bio anywhere. I would have. I don't think I have Jason Bateman in there. I said, listen, there's just too many people, the name, but it's just so exciting because, you know, it's a life well lived and you still have so much going on. And we love that, you know, uh, here's where I want to go next because so much of what you've talked about, you've got this finance background running in the background. In some cases, you are the investor, um, and in this case, with um, you know vertical grooves, you invested in that company. Um, but talk to us a little bit about the funding, because you you created budgets and you understand um, getting a project funded. So I just want to touch on that because so many people are always strapped while they're bootstrapping a project, and um, yeah, I'm just curious about your process around raising funds for projects, or did you self-fund? So every industry has their standards. The film industry has theirs. Um, don't know much about the music industry. I, you know, I think it's closely related to you know the film industry, but I haven't created budgets for making an album or, or you know making a song. Um, and so the small manufacturing industry, which is where I find myself now, 
also has a set of templates for which you can follow to make budgets. It's very hard to ask people for money unless you tell them exactly how you're going to spend it. And that's a very similar thing to making a movie. Um, I've also bought and sold real estate. Same thing. Very hard to ask a bank to give you a million bucks because you want to buy a house unless they see exactly why they think it's going to be a valuable house at the price that you want to buy it at. So what I've discovered in for small manufacturing, there is a fantastic website called SCORE, which was introduced to me by um, uh, a woman at the uh, Small Business Council. But SCORE has Excel templates that you can download where you can plug in what you envision as numbers on how you're going to monetize your fantastic idea. So how many turntables do you think you're going to sell? Well, I don't know. Okay, well, when you find out, do some research, plug it into here, and let me know. That forced me to kind of say, how many turntables sell in the world? How many of those turntables are vertical? How many vinyl albums are being sold in the world? How many, um, you know, uh, what is the size of the turntable market? So all these things just, you know, pushed me along, pushed me along, plugging in numbers where I've now been able to put together a half a dozen spreadsheets where I can show people and say, all right, here's how much money I'm looking for. Here's what my expectations are. Here's what could happen. If we get lucky, here's what I hope happens. Mm -hmm. Don't get lucky. You know, here's the minimum. But at least now I've built a certain amount of confidence in them that I've done my work, I've done my research, I've done my analysis, and hopefully they step up with, you know, a large amount of money that says, I love it. I love, you know, I love who you are as a person and as a manager. And I really think that turntable was super badass. Yeah. <laughs> so exactly. it's that combination of both, and then yeah. you know, you're off and running. Yeah, you know, it's brilliant. I mean, basically what you just described, right, in terms of the manufacturing side is, you know, I'm teaching a class tomorrow on getting funding for your independent film. And we talk about comparables, right? They're comparables in real estate. And I'm glad you mentioned that because those structures are very similar. And before people can even ask for money, they really have to have a keen sense of the budget, what they're asking for, and be able to show what's out there in the market. So I use... Um, uh, box office mojo, right, which helps individuals to see comparable rom-coms, comedies, of the genre that people are looking at to fund, get funding for, and how that did in the theaters. Of course, the pandemic has thrown everybody and all box office numbers off, but there are sources out there to be able to give you a number that's a little more realistic before you create your deal memo, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted you to touch base on that because um, so many individuals are creating films. They think when they get funding, they kind of think like, yeah, yeah, I got it. But it's like, whoa, it's not yours. <laughs> you got to protect it, you know? And hopefully, you know, your project will go to screen that you'll get 120 plus back, right? So that you can pay off your investors and then maybe you make a profit, I don't know. So let me ask you this, on the projects, because you have been successful at getting projects to screen, whether that's to a film screen or a computer screen. It's been out there. Huh? I, I uh, both. I mean, I've been yeah, in yeah. all around the world. Right. So, talk to us a little bit about that feeling um, of when just getting it to screen. Um, it. I, I'll, I'll I'll contextualize this into one just glorious moment. So. When I did Kiss Me Guido, I was getting frustrated. People liked the script, but they didn't want to give me money to make the movie. And somebody wanted to buy the script, but I really wanted to make my own movie. So I created a one-line schedule as well as a budget. What put me over the top was I storyboarded every single frame of this simple comedy. And my producer, Ira Deutschman at the time, said, wow, I've never seen a filmmaker do that. As simple as a two-shot. You know, two people talking and then cutting close up, close up. I storyboarded it all out and said, this is where all the money's going to be spent. 
Um, I wound up raising about $750,000 after that. Um, made the movie. But the one moment that I really want to share, that, which I think is kind of funny based on your question, is one of the very first jokes that I wrote in the movie, which I thought was hysterical, um, and it could be pretty crude, but always had me laughing. When you hear that same joke 50 times, it's no longer funny. You're wondering if it's ever gonna be funny. You're wondering if any, anyone else is gonna think it's funny. So you shoot it, you write it, you shoot it, you edit it, and then until that first person in the theater sees it, you don't know what you have. And I can remember this day like, you know, as if it was yesterday, when we screened our first premiere screening at the Sundance Film Festival, this was 1997. I was so nervous. I was in, you know, I was shaking because I didn't know how the audience was going to respond. And then when that first joke came out and the audience just started howling, I swear to you, five years of my life just got put into that one moment of that's the way I felt when I first wrote that joke and I made it. You know, I, you know, at that point, I couldn't care how much we sold it for. I couldn't care, <laughs> uh, you know, what was going to happen with it. But right. I did it. You know, that, that, that one simple joke that lasted over five years um, and, then it, and then it worked was a phenomenal experience. Thank you for sharing that, Tony. That's very valuable. And here's why. You said it took for over five years. There are filmmakers who have ideas who can't get the funding. Then they finally get it. And they've got to live through these processes. Mm -hmm. And the point is, is, thank you for sharing that because it gives hope. It's like, don't ever give up on it, right? right. Like the payoff will come. Don't doubt it. We just had our first CCE short films screening cool. on Wednesday. All right. And one of the filmmakers um, was in-house. We had three that were remote and they dialed in virtually, but we had our last filmmaker and it was like a nine minute film who was present. It was the longest film and it was the most impactful. And I just couldn't even hold the tears back. You know, when I got up on stage, I was like, I'm just going to let it flow because she needs to know how impactful this is. And so does everybody else who's probably feeling the same thing. And it's what you just said. She didn't know how people were going to respond. She didn't know if it was going to be good. Right. And it was like, not only is it good, you're like touching people at their core, like in their soul. And it's a story that should be told. Now, interesting thing, they self-funded. And so after we walked out, I said, okay, tell me though, I, I, I'm teaching a class on Saturday about getting funding. And I said, I got to ask you, I'm curious about your budget you know, and um, I'm not telling her name or anything. And so I said, um, what was the budget? And she was about 25,000. I, I picked it at about 25, 30 K on a nine minute about that the quality was brilliant. Nice. And I said, here's the deal. She was afraid to shop it, to ask people for money for her idea. And she also didn't want to change anything. She, they did shop it a little bit. People were like, well, could you tweak this? Could you tweak that? Well, maybe we shouldn't say that. And she wanted to be committed to her story. So they self-funded and I said, well, this is the thing. Here's the deal. You can use this movie now to get funded for a full feature, period, mm -hmm. period. Plus you're going to show that you have skin in the game because you've invested in your own idea. Right. right. And as an investor, you understand the value of that. You're like, you want money for me? What have you put in there? Right. Right. <laughs> and not everybody can, but when investors see talent, and I'm using that word investor, mm -hmm. I've been told that investors invest in the person more than, in, more than investing in the project and the idea. What are your thoughts around that? Um, I think it's, it has to be a combination of both. Okay. It has to, because an investor wants to have a return on their money. They, you know, they want to get that 120, 125% back. That's just standard operating procedure. Mm -hmm. Um, films are very risky. I will say this. If you can't touch someone's soul, let me take that back. If you can't touch someone's spirit, and the reason why I'm changing soul to spirit 
is because some people like horror films, some people like comedies, some people like dramas. If you're if you're able to touch and invest this spirit, and they can get a little bit beyond how much money they're going to make back, mm -hmm. then you got a shot. But if you can't touch and invest the spirit, and all it is is, am I going to make money on this? You could stand on your head. You could have so much talent. You could be the greatest person in the world. You're not going to get any money. So you, when you're trying to raise money, you gotta, you've got to hopefully find that and tap into that that person's what makes them tick, what moves them, what what makes them feel like, man, if I'm going to die, this is something I would kind of like to be known for when I'm dead. Yeah, I call that I call that the dance. You know, you've got to you've got to, it's a, it's relationship building. You've got to know who your investor is. You've got to, like you said, understand what moves them. It's not like just asking somebody for money and people don't really understand. It can take months and years for the trust to develop. It's a nurturing process that has to happen. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So what, what career I've lost track. How many, how many <laughs> have you done, Tony? <laughs> I don't want to count. I don't have enough toes and fingers for that. Well, there was this Wall Street Journal article that came up that talked about, on average, at this point, with um, individuals switching careers at multiple times, that most people um, have entered into around seven careers. Yes. You know, they say they, um, they. scientists say that we change our skin layers every seven years. So the, you know, the same skin that a baby is born with, it kind of like takes seven years for that deepest layer to all of a sudden be gone. Interesting. Yeah, it's a, something quirky I read somewhere. <laughs> um, and so, you know, the idea of, you know, kind of changing careers mm -hmm. every, you know, seven years, eight years, um, might not be too far off the mark. <laughs> so, Big ones, you know. Uh, I wouldn't call sitting on a paint can a career, but I was in the film business earning a living. So. Yes. But let's just say sitting on that paint can watching paint dry. Yeah. Never, big time. Like um, really open the door to a world and to people who could be able to open more doors um, to those visions and those dreams that you had for yourself. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate you so much for uh, thank you. Sharing, you know sharing with our entrepreneurs um, ways to guide them in these processes. And all of these stories have a through line, and they all are still evolving, right? Because mm -hmm. you are on to now the vertical groove keeping your groove going. I'm really excited about the opportunity of being able to create a DJ battle between the grooves. Yeah. <laughs> Is there any um, one or two tips left that you have in mind you'd like to share with our creative entrepreneur audience? You know, it's it starts, I, I, can't, I can't overstate this enough. It really starts with passion. Mm -hmm. Just like you want to get an investor that wants to be known for something before they die, you have to look at yourself and say, and especially as a writer, here, okay, filmmakers, you want to hone in on filmmakers? Yeah. What's the one story that you want to tell that you will regret if you didn't get a chance to tell that story and mm. you die tomorrow? When I used to, I taught screenwriting at UCLA, another career. Yeah. Um, that's what, you know, everyone had all these ideas. What makes a blockbuster? You know, I don't know, but I'm, I, I, I think you should aim for what's the story you want to tell before you die? Mm. If you could come from that place, yeah. Well, then you have a shot at completing the screenplay, talking about it passionately, making the movie, and becoming that huge success. Love it. If you can't even get to that spot, it's gonna be a tough road. And be a tough road. Well, this has been a wonderful road down yeah. the journey of uh, some of the twists and turns of your life, and so far. Oh, the sun has been shining. I mean, there was some rain probably <laughs> when you were on the floor, um, the stock market, and things were all over the place, but every road led to where you are now. And that's the most important part. So thank you so much. Tony. Thank you. This is great. So, much so much fun. So great to have him with us. You know, I tell you, um, 
it's brilliant when we have opportunities to have visionaries, thought leaders, and individuals sharing their gifts, sharing their meaningful stories, and the relationships that they created along the way to continue their path toward their dream. And as you see and heard from Tony Vitale today, we all have had many careers. What career are you on? Don't be afraid to try something new. Don't be afraid to take that idea, put it to pen and paper. And guess what? Don't give up on it because sometimes it takes five years. It could take a lifetime. But what story do you want to tell? What creative instrument or thing do you want to manufacture? We are at an incredible time in history where we get to think and figure out what we want to do and then make it happen. I'm Sadia Davis for the Center for Creative Entrepreneurship. That word gets stuck in there sometimes, but I'm so happy to be able to share our gifts and our resources and our relationships and friendships with you all. Have a wonderful weekend and be kind to one another.